the Palestinian dissident and political prisoner Ahed Tamimi has been released from an Israeli jail. She was just one of the 30 Palestinian detainees, including 16 children and 14 adult women, freed by Israel. Here is Ahed speaking after her release. Tamimi was arrested by Israeli forces earlier this month for an Instagram post that her family says she did not write. It was not Tamimi's first time in Israeli captivity. In 2017, a 16-year-old Ahed was filmed kicking and slapping an Israeli soldier after her cousin was shot in the head by a rubber bullet. Later arrested, she served eight months in prison for slapping that soldier. This is how occupying forces attempt to humiliate those they're occupying. Ahed's release came as part of the sixth exchange of detainees today since the truce began last Friday. On Wednesday evening, a further 10 Israeli hostages, as well as five Thai nationals, were handed to the Red Cross by Hamas guerrillas at Gaza's Egyptian border. Included among the Israelis were five minors and five women. Also on Thursday night, Israel and Hamas agreed a further extension to the truce, though it only appears to be for 24 hours. As a result, two further hostages have been released by Hamas, with more expected to be freed before Friday morning, which is when Israel's attack on Gaza might resume if no further extension is agreed. The prospect of renewed military intervention in Gaza by Israel comes as the World Health Organization warned of an impending risk of famine in the territory, with 1.7 million people displaced in the Gaza Strip amid severe food and fuel shortages after seven weeks of blockade. Six days has not been enough time for aid to reach all who need it. The World Health Organization says it was able to deliver food to just 120,000 people during the pause. Remember, there's 2.2 million people in Gaza. The pause has also allowed some Palestinians to return to their homes, many of which have been destroyed. And some are also having to relive the horror of the bombardment that drove them away. CNN has broadcast one family's account of their indescribable loss. I should warn you, this footage contains scenes that some might find disturbing. Khaled and Reem were inseparable. Her grandfather was her whole world. Her favorite game, pulling his beard, and he would pull her piggy tails. I'll let go, she says, if you let go. <laughs> Khaled just can't let go of his little Reem. Now searching for memories amid the rubble of his home. <laughs> This was Reem's doll, he says. The family was asleep when an airstrike nearby brought down their house in southern Gaza last week. Khaled woke up screaming for his children and grandchildren, struggling to walk in the dark and through the wreckage to find them. I couldn't find anyone. They were buried underneath all this rubble, he says. My daughter Mesa was here. Her children, Reem and Tarek, were here in her arms. Mesa and her sister barely survived. After a few days in intensive care, they're now recovering at a relative's house. I felt something heavy on top of me. I started screaming, Mesa says. 
I heard Dream screaming next to me. I told her, there's something heavy on top of me. I can't reach you. I said my final prayers. And next, I woke up in the hospital. Mesa woke up to the news. Her three- and five-year-old children were gone. Their lifeless bodies found together under the rubble. They slept next to each other that night. They slept early, she says. I told them to stay up a little longer, but they said they wanted to sleep. At the hospital, I was just numb, she says. I hugged them. I wanted to get as many hugs as I could. No matter how much I hugged them, I didn't get enough. That is, of course, a story that will have been replicated thousands of times across Gaza, where so far, over 6,000 children have been killed. And even that doesn't capture the horror of the assault, with 15,000 people we think killed in total, and an estimated 7,000 bodies still missing beneath the rubble of the devastated territory. Sometimes children have been pulled from that rubble after days stuck there. So let's go to just a bit more of that report. With their father abroad working, they lived with their grandfather. Reem was so attached to him, and he spoiled her. They kept asking for fruit, but there's no fruit because of the war, he says. I could only find them these tangerines. Khalid holds the tangerine he gave Reem, the one she didn't get to eat, and pinned close to his heart her tiny earring. He breaks down as he remembers their final evening how his grandchildren begged him to take them out to play. But he couldn't. Airstrikes were everywhere. Khaled says he's not a fighter. They had nothing to do with the war. But like so many in Gaza, his family paid the price. Khaled held Reem in his arms for one last time. He hugged her motionless body, opened her eyes and kissed her goodbye. I was asking her to kiss me like she used to, but she didn't, he says. I used to kiss her on her cheeks, on her nose, and she would giggle. I kissed her, but she wouldn't wake up, he recalls. I held Tare. I fixed his hair the way he liked it. I was wishing, hoping they were only sleeping, he says, but they weren't sleeping. They're gone. Gone a month before her fourth birthday, a birthday Reem shared with her grandfather. <laughs> she was the soul of my soul, Khaled says. <laughs> Mass civilian casualties, potential famine and disease, and unimaginable displacement. Now, a shooting in Jerusalem too, where two brothers reportedly opened fire on people waiting for a bus. Five people were killed, including the two Palestinian gunmen and 16 people were injured. Hamas has confirmed that the men were members, saying, quote, the operation came as a natural response to unprecedented crimes conducted by the occupation. Hamas mentioned both the brutalization of Gaza and the torture of Palestinian prisoners who are kidnapped by occupation soldiers, sometimes shoved into sham courts that boast 99% conviction rates, and then imprisoned for years and abused. Well, I'm joined now by Moya, and I'm very happy to say it. Moya, why is there more outrage in the Western media about the violence of the colonized and about Israeli hostages than about the daily violence against Palestinians and the thousands languishing in Israeli jails? I think it's a question that we've been addressing regularly on this show. And apologies to my parents, that last report about um, reading the four-year-old girl really, really got to me. Uh, so what we've seen is there is coverage in the Western media. There is outrage in the West about the violence against Palestinians, but it comes in pockets. It comes in small, little pieces. And it's always a drop in the ocean compared to the ultimate framing of, you know, the Palestinians are somehow in the way of the Israelis, they're blocking this determinate the determination uh, that the Israelis have and the birthright that the Israelis have to create their safe haven. That's the unconscious message that's given to us. So when we see the humanization of Palestinians, it's always in very small, piecemeal bits, like we saw with that CNN report. This really, you know, absolutely devastating 
a piece of reportage that looks at this one family and stresses they were not involved in the war, they are exempt from the war. It completely says this is the standard of innocence we have. But then you look at all the other coverage CNN has been doing, particularly the coverage where they've had to run it through the IDF before getting it approved for broadcast. And you see how that report, that really humanising report that shows Palestinians um, as a population under bombardment, a population who are enduring some of the most horrific ethnic cleansing possible, uh, is positioned against the rest of the coverage, which, you know, situates what Israel is doing as this, this mission, almost sent, this mission of faith that is sent to wipe out Hamas, that is necessary, uh, that is important in order to protect Israel and the Israeli population. And when you also look at the coverage of Palestinians, and I'll take that CNN report again, um, it makes sure that only some Palestinians are given that option of humanity in even those small pockets. So it's children, it's a grandfather. But if you look at the way that they'll frame, for example, young men or even people who might be involved in Hamas, there is no exploration of motivation, there is no exploration of the wider context in which they may have taken up arms or which they may have been motivated to act against an occupying situation. There is only these people are evil or if you have thrown a stone at a tank or if you have uh, fought back in any way, you are robbed of the legitimacy um, of your humanity. Um, and I also have been rereading around prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, because I think that's quite a telling ongoing situation and it's not that in western media in particular there hasn't been coverage of palestinian prisoners and the treatment that they experience at the hands of the israeli justice system there's been coverage multiple times across the years so all throughout the 20th century and then if you go into the 20 2000s you know in 2005 there was extensive coverage that cropped up again and again and again about palestinian prisoners but it always ends with this appeal by the Palestinians talking to the international community in Western media. And it's an appeal that's never answered, which is very, very telling. So the Israeli state playbook has not really changed since 1947. What is happening is they're always testing to see how Western states respond, how Western media responds, the more brutality they meter out to the Palestinians, the more they advance this ongoing Nakba. And what, the, the, what they've he heard loud and clear from the West is that international justice doesn't apply. There may be a bit of hand-wringing, a couple of Western media reports about how bad it is for, you know, Palestinian civilians, Palestinian prisoners. But ultimately, the level of violence is increased and increased and increased until we see what we're seeing now, which is this full-blown campaign of ethnic cleansing out in the open once more. I saw a member of the British Parliament stand up in the House of Commons and say he was very concerned about aid reaching Israeli hostages. They had to be fed and clothed and looked after um, while they were uh, uh, being held by Hamas, with no concern for hundreds of thousands, millions of Palestinian people. And what we have witnessed in the language around Palestine is what W.B. Du Bois a century ago called a color line, like that global color line that he said would be the defining issue of the 20th century. It's still a defining issue for us, which is that some people are coded, marked out for an inferior package of rights, ultimately for dispossession. And it's a color line familiar to everyone who gets on a small and rickety boat to try to reach safety across the Mediterranean or the Aegean um, or, or the English Channel. It's a color line familiar to people all over the world who are expected to labor and to die in appalling conditions for prosperity, wealth enjoyed elsewhere. And it's a color line that will become especially pressing. And the Colombian president, Gustavo Petro, said this in his statement about Gaza, especially pressing as we face climate brutalization. A, a world in which many, many millions of people, possibly many, many billions of people, will be told that the walls must grow higher to keep them out as the places that they live burn or as they drown, the choice that we face, and it is the choice represented by Palestine and by all of us who pour onto the streets to support the Palestinian people, is a choice between a world in which some lives matter and other people are, are, are treated as expendable, or a world in which everyone lives in freedom. That's what the Palestinian flag represents, and it's what horrifies the Western media and Western politicians. 